I'm Kathy McCreese. I'm the director here at One Away Contemporary. Thank all of you for being here this evening and uh, the opening um, preview party of our 2016 Vision Makers. Um, I'd like to thank just a few people and sponsors for this evening. First of all, Bank of Oklahoma. I know there are quite a few of you here this evening. Um, is hosting this preview party, this lovely preview party. So thanks to all of you for doing that. Um, there's a little interesting factoid of some of you that um, have been involved or have known about Vision Makers for many years. It began uh, back in 1988 in Oklahoma City, and I believe, uh, correct me, anyone who knows, if I'm wrong, that it went back and forth between Tulsa and Oklahoma City for a while. And the second uh, year, uh, 1989, it came to Tulsa, and it was in the Bank of Oklahoma Tower on the Zephyr Plaza level there. So it's kind of a nice little circle to have the OK hosting this evening and have the first Tulsa event be in the tower there. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Hogan Assessment Systems. They are a brand new neighbor. Well, not brand new. They've been in the um, area for about a year. They moved their um, international headquarters uh, down the street just a little bit, and they have supported our Hogan Visionary Awards. It's a prize of $10,000, and I believe it's gone to five um, artists in, in the exhibition at that Anita picked out, and you will see the insignia and the award that each of them got, so take a look um, at those as you walk around. Um, thank you to our amazing committee, uh, headed by Beth Downey, who was the chairperson of the committee, and Teresa Valero, uh, Myra, Myra, Myra Kaiser, Myra Block Kaiser, and Jeanne Fouser, who are also on the committee, so thanks for all the hard work that you've done, and of course the staff, who always does an amazing amount of work and works um, a lot of hours and puts heart and soul into it, so thanks to all of you. We are honored to welcome Namita Kucha Wiggers, um, for, to, who is the curator of this exhibition. She is an internationally recognized curator, um, a writer, and educator based in Portland, Oregon. She is a director and co founder of Critical Craft Forum. Please correct me if I get any of this a little bit off, because she's done so many things. She teaches MFA Applied Craft and Design, co-administered by Oregon College of Art and Craft and Pacific Northwest College of Art. From 2004 to 2014, she served as the director and chief curator for the Museum of Contemporary Craft, Portland. And she travels extensively and is an authority on what is happening in contemporary fine craft around the world. So we're very pleased to have her uh, during this exhibition and to be here this evening. Thank you, Anita. And you're welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, I wonder if we might have all the artists who are here just raise your hand so people can see. So we've got one, two, three, I'm short four. <laughs> Am I five? Am I missing any band back there? Six? maybe six, seven, seven or so people. So um, as, after, as I walk through, I'm gonna to just touch on a few pieces. I would like to talk about each and every single one, but we don't wanna stay that long. Um, so I would say that the folks who are artists are wearing tags, and so if you have more questions, this is such an amazing opportunity to get to talk to artists directly and find out more about the pieces. So do take, take a minute and talk to them about their work as well. Um, I want to thank the committee and Contemporary 108 for this invitation. I'm very excited to be here. I know you all, based on the Bohemian event last night, know that Tulsa is a pretty happening and fun um, art scene. But you all should know that Tulsa is getting talked about all over the place around the country. Um, as a really exciting, dynamic, interesting new place where there is some attention being paid to the arts. So whatever it is y'all are doing, you're doing it really, really well. So keep it up, and um, I think it's going to be really exciting to see what continues to happen in this community over the next five, ten years. Um, your competition is Omaha, so um, I think go for it. <laughs> get the chance to look at all of the work and, and 
I don't know if any artists are here whose work was not selected, but um, for those of you who've gone through this process, or those of you who haven't, please understand this is a really hard thing for an artist to do. It's very courageous to put your work out there and share it with people and trust that somebody is going to understand what you're doing from a photograph. And um, so it's a, it's, artists have to be brave each and every single time they put their work out there. And I want to thank each of the artists um, who submitted work. And uh, thank you to the staff for just a really wonderful welcome and to everybody. So what I'm going to do is just touch on a couple of pieces and talk a little bit about why I chose them and um, how they sort of touch on some of the things that are going on with craft right now. And I wanted to start with this piece by Sofia Gonzalez. So one of the things that's happening right now, and, and the award that I gave to this piece is the Contemporary Craft Zeitgeist Award. And the reason is because right now, there's a huge resurgence of interest in uh, natural dyeing techniques. And, um, if you think about the life cycle of an object, you know, you can start, especially with craft, things start at the material level, right? It can start with metal that you, you pull out of the earth. It can start with dirt that comes from the earth that becomes clay that, that then you use to make pottery. Um, with textiles, one of the places that it starts in, in, in this life cycle process is this place of natural dyes. And I think that because we are such a tech-oriented um, culture, we are all walking around, and I've got my, my little umbilical cord, just like the rest of you, we all have these with us. There seems to be, at the same time now, a real interest in um, tactile processes. And dyes are something that we have used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years as human beings. So there's a really strong interest, and this piece to me, the reason I gave it the Zeitgeist Award is because it really speaks to something that's happening right now in contemporary craft and in really in culture in, in general. Um, I love the juxtaposition that the committee did when they installed this because I think together these two pieces bring out some of the really wonderful um, qualities of, of the simple grid and the way that the grid functions as a building block, literally blocks in the wood, but and blocks on the, the textile. But it gives a really great example of kind of this minimal thing that can happen when you're you're working with simple materials. Pieces it has a, we were speaking yesterday about how it has a very Louise Nevelson sort of feel to it. Paul Frankel is a furniture maker who also did some very interesting architectural kinds of pieces. But what I loved about this is the way that the artist didn't pretend that the wood wasn't recycled. She found a really nice way of using the materials and letting the materials sort of do what they are. And um, one of the things that happens a lot of times right now is young people get hold of recycled wood because it's cheaper and you're an artist and so you use the cheapest materials you can get. And they try to make it look brand new. And this doesn't pretend to be other, anything other than something that's put together to look and evoke a feeling of something that's been assembled. And this is by Molly Adams. And I really, again, this is one of those moments where um, the thing about jurying an exhibition is you see hundreds and hundreds of pictures, right? But if you don't understand the space that these objects are going to go into, sometimes it can be really tricky. And we did, we exchanged images so I could understand what the space felt like. But this is such a wonderful installation and it's so sensitive to the object. So I want to thank the staff and the committee that, that put the installation together because it really brings out beautiful qualities in the work. So these pieces are, um, they're very understated and very simple and kind of minimal. But the reason I selected them is they show how somebody really understands how clay is going to work. So those of you who work with clay know that if you don't know, if you don't know what you're doing, this is going to collapse, right? This is going to fall down. You really have to understand 
the material. And I think that this really, these pieces in particular show that, the way that, that um, you have to understand, it, it, they're designed in a way where you feel the air inside them, the space inside them, so that negative space is just as important as the form itself. The other thing that I really appreciated too is, these days there's sort of this real unabashed love of ornament and pattern that is different than, say, in past decades. And what I really appreciated about these pieces is that they don't pretend that ornament and pattern and surface treatment is something that you have to like deny. They're simple, they're minimal, they're understated, but there's a lot of curves and ornamentation going on at the same time, and I really, really like that quality in them. Molly's work I've, I've seen before, and I really, I feel that, that um, her work operates in a, in a tricky area because it, um, I've been on panels that have been looking at Native American artists, and there's a tendency to try to figure out where to place her work and place work like this. I think the working over with the beads on the photograph is a really powerful way of reinterpreting an image, a landscape, um, and bringing in other craft-based traditions other than kind of um, the ones that we would expect. Uh, you know, with all of our backgrounds and our history, it tends to be more European kinds of things. But I think that Molly does a really fantastic job of calling attention to the landscape to beadwork and also to this kind of interesting thing that happens in the United States where um, there's a push-pull between all the different kinds of ways that you can categorize an artist and I think her work really brings that out quite a bit. Um, I really, I wanted to get your attention to the way that the grouping here calls your eye to surfaces and to the form of the vessel. You know, the shape of a vessel, the way that a vessel sits on a piece of, on, on this, this surface, this negative space here, the way that it, this comes up and the surface texture is there. I actually think that this necklace here looks more fantastic in real life than it actually looks in the photograph. And I think part of it is because of the juxtaposition with those vessels there, it really brings out all those surface qualities. That's the thing about craft that is different from other kinds of visual arts. You've got this graphic surface, right? You've got this form, this big solid shape. It's an interesting silhouette. But when you come up close, you get rewarded by something else going on at the surface. And that's what I think that this grouping really, really brings out. And um, from the small to the large to the really, really large, the Max's piece. Max is someone who um, is a younger artist. He's someone who I guess, I hate these terms, but I guess you could call him emerging because he's not been working quite as long. Um, but he is, uh, he won a fellowship from the Wingate Foundation, which is one of the foundations that has, um, if it wasn't for the Wingate Fellowships and the Wingate Foundation, uh, you wouldn't be seeing a lot of the resurgence in craft that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. So uh, they really have done a lot to support artists. And Max is a great example of a younger artist who is trained in sculpture and he understands kind of the, um, the questions that you're taught when you're studying in an art school, but he combines that with other kinds of traditional craft forms. In his case, he studied puppetry in India, and he's bringing together all of this understanding of piecing things together and taking something that seems lifeless and animating it and bringing it to life. And I felt this was a really great example of his work um, but also a really great example of combining these different forms of um, communicating through objects, and it really comes through with this. So this is the piece, uh, these are the three pieces together um, that I awarded the, uh, the uh, best of show to. They are by Lynn Staniotis, and she is from Kansas. Oh, and I don't know if you all know, did you know that this is the first time this is the first time that the uh, that there were seven states, right? This is the first time that it's been expanded into a seven-state region. So you're getting a sampling from seven different parts of the country, which is pretty amazing to get to see in one state. Um, so the reason that I gave this the best of show is 
These pieces are spectacular. You come up and stick your nose close. Don't touch. Put your nose in there and see the construction that has gone into these pieces. They are absolutely exquisitely made. And in addition to that, there's this narrative, this storytelling, this way of dealing with organic material that's just exquisite in these pieces. And um, sometimes I like to shake things up. Um, like when the Glass Society came to Portland, I exhibited uh, the work of an artist who had a piece of Benson Industries glass on a plinth to see if it would torque and break. Um, and so I'm not always somebody who goes straight for like, the super high-level craftsmanship, but in terms of the pieces that were submitted to me to jury for this exhibition, it was really hard not to recognize the superb craftsmanship of these pieces and that they really exemplify the kind of thing that a jeweler can do where they take the material and turn it into these amazing small little objects that have so much going on in them. So that was partly why I chose that piece for, the, uh, for that award. You can see the edges of the mold on the sides of the stool there. And they almost seem like seams, like you've sewn leather together or something. But the, the animated quality of the pieces and the way she uses this material that we understand in one way and makes us look at it as a completely different kind of material, that's what understanding materials and knowing how to use your hands, that's what comes out of craft, is that really deep material knowledge and ability to kind of make you think about materials in a different sort of way. So that was what impressed me about those pieces. And the last piece I'm going to talk about is this piece by David. I like that this is juxtaposed with this because this is jacquard loom weaving. And jacquard is something that you might see, um, it's, it's, it's really popular again right now because it's a way of making a very crisp photographic image um, through a textile, right? And Jacquard looms are the looms that helped people figure out how computers work. I don't know how many of you knew that, but it's definitely related to the way that computer technology operates and, and, and it helped people figure it out. What David is doing is combining a couple of different kinds of weaving techniques in a way that is very personal, but also very evocative of other things. For example, I mean, you get these landscapes right down the middle, right? And they are, they are jacquard loom woven, but um, he sends them out, he shared with me earlier that these are pieces that he designs and then they're fabricated outside of his studio. But the pieces on the ends are hand woven. And there was something about the strips that made me think about, um, I think that somebody showed me there was a shop nearby the, that sells African uh, pieces from Africa and Ethnica, Ethnica. If you go to Ethnica, you'll see that there's, I'm sure she has textiles that where it's strips that are woven and then stitched together. This is the way that in a smaller loom, you can, you can make long pieces and then assemble them together to make a really large textile. This is the kind of thing you might see from um, Nigeria, for example. You also see it in uh, Central and South America as well. And so what you've got are this combination of a couple of different kinds of ways of weaving that are all constructed together and it's, it's quilted so that it'll stand properly on there. So if David 
David can show you the back. I can't touch it, but he can touch it. <laughs> and then he can show you how he's he's held it together so it keeps its its uh, rectangular shape. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting is the way that it talks about time. Um, these look like film strips, and film is all about moments and and these these frames coming down. And it was almost like to me that the center was this close-up, this close-up into what might have been going on in these film strip parts that were going really, really rapidly fast by you. So there was something about that, and I was, I was pleased when I, we spoke earlier, David shared that, that that question of the moments and time was something he's been thinking about with this, this body of work as well. Um, I told him that one of my favorite parts is this part here, where you'll notice that it looks kind of Kind of like a, a digital, um, God, what do they call those? Like a, like a little disruption kind of, where the digital thing just kind of skips. And he explained that that's actually the end of the textile. So it's one of those things where I was reading it in this one way as a digital kind of a, of a, um, a digital effect when it actually is just a part of the textile that normally you would dispose of and not use. So there's a lot of good details in here to take a look at and see the difference between the kinds of, of um, weaving there. And that was why I gave that the technical award, because I felt like it really hopefully helps get, get people to look more closely at how weaving happens and how different kinds of woven structures produce different kinds of effects. So that is just a highlight of parts of the show. So, I'm, I'm going to be here, so if anybody has any more questions uh, about pieces, please come find me. If you're in one of the artists and I haven't met you yet, please come say hello. And um, thank you all and enjoy the exhibition. Yeah.